You're very welcome to this recording, which we're going to focus for week seven on AC220. So where we left it in week five before we had reading week was we got halfway through roughly financial statement analysis, a core area around interpreting a set of financial statements. And it's often called ratio analysis for anyone who did leave and start accounting might call it that. And we started to look at some of the key areas in a set of financial statements. And we said there's five main areas you're going to be looking at profitability, efficiency, liquidity, gearing and investment. And we talked through in week five what each of those key areas are. And we start to introduce, particularly in terms of profitability, we worked through how profitable a company is, calculating margins, how profitable a company is with respect or relative to sales. And we also looked at the return a company earns, which is return on capital employed or return on shareholders funds, sometimes known, the second one there, as return on equity. That's how profitable a company is relative to the capital that's invested in the business. We then went on um, the last day and we started looking at the whole idea of efficiency. And the last thing we did in week five before we broke up for reading week was calculating this whole idea of the cash conversion cycle or the working capital cycle. And it's made up of a combination of three things. And we used an example on the board in week five to illustrate that. How long does your inventory stay on hand? The inventory days. Plus how long it takes your customers to pay you less how long it takes you to pay your suppliers. That overall cycle is how long it takes you to convert cash between when you pay your suppliers than when you get it, the money in from your customer. And we said the lower that is, the better. The shorter the inventory days, the shorter the debtor days, and the longer the payable days. Albeit with exceptions, you can't keep no inventory because you won't make sales. You can't offer no trade credit because some industries trade credit is part and parcel of dealing business with the customers. And you can't take as long as you want with suppliers, because if you do, they may not sell you the next time or they may charge you more. So there's a balance to be had. And you're going to cover that in corporate finance with lean, where you deal with working capital management in more detail. But that can be called the cash conversion cycle or the working capital cycle. And we also said in some businesses, in some industries, that can actually be negative. And we gave the example of a supermarket where supermarket has very low inventory days. Stuff is sold very quickly off the shelves. It has no debtor days because the customer pays when they go to the checkout. And it can have long enough payable days because the supermarkets have a lot of negotiating power. They may not pay for 60 or 90 days uh, after they actually get delivery of the goods. So they can actually have a negative cash conversion cycle. So when you're comparing cash conversion cycles or working capital cycles, you have to compare like for like, compare companies in the same industry. In terms of calculating these ratios, there's a formula here. Debtor days, otherwise known as trade receivable days, is trade receivables or trade debtors over revenue. Sometimes you can take the average trade debtors, i.e. the start and the end of the year divided by two. Taking the end of year is fine here. You divide that by revenue. If you're given credit revenue, i.e. the total amount of sales on credit, use that figure. If you're not given it, use the total revenue figure. Right? So it just depends what information is given. Inventory, you can use the average inventory if you have it for both years. Otherwise, use the end of year inventory. Cost of sales is fine for the year. Trade payables, likewise. If you have the average opening and closing for both years, use it. You rarely have the average for both years. You can't use the average for one year and the end of year figure for the other. So be consistent. If you can't do the average for both, take the end of your trade payables for both. So we're going to put this into practice now. And we're using the example we had in class in week five, which is called a Lexus. And you would have went through that already. So we're going to continue on now. We're going to look at trade receivable days. We're going to look at inventory days. And we're going to look at trade payable days. And we're looking at two different years. I have to make that a small bit bigger to follow. We're looking at 2011 and 2012. So again, a lot of this, this is going to be very useful for your continuous assessment as well, because part of this is going to be calculating ratios. So it'll be useful to have practice of this. Calculating them is one thing. Interpreting, understanding what they mean is the extra add-on that you really need to be able to do as well. So let's focus then on calculating trade receivable days first. For 2011, you take the trade receivables, 240, divided by the revenue. Now, note two tells us here, all sales and purchases are made on credit. So that means we can just take the total figure. If you're given credit sales, you just use that. So here it's going to be 240 
divided by 2240 times 365. That should be times 365, 39.1. So 39.1 days, and we'll interpret them in a second, don't worry. We'll figure out what does that actually mean then. So you can round to whole days if you want. We'll just round to whole days. So 39, the answer there is in days. So what does that mean? That means in 2011, it took on average 39 days for your customers to pay you. It took on average 39 days for your customers to pay you. The longer that is, the more costly it is because you're waiting for money to come in from your customers. So the longer it is, the more uh, costly it is because you have to finance that. So essentially what you're saying is what percentage of annual sales does the, the trade receivables outstanding represent? And multiply by that 365 to get it in days. If you multiply it by 12, you get it in months. We typically do it in days. Then, so I'll just put there 240 divided by 2240 times 365. That would be in the solution when you get out uh, on loop. So we won't, we'll hide that for now, but that's where the formula comes from. Just make it a bit smaller so people can see it. I can bring this over a small bit. I will bring this over so we can fit it all in. We'll do it for the other year as well, just while we have it. The 2012, you have Trade receivers 273 over 2681. 273 over 2681 times 365. And that means in 2012, it's gone up to 37 days. Just do that. We'll do it. You can do it the whole days, it's fine. You don't need to go any more detail than that. 37 days. And I'll just show you the formula there. Just so for tutorial purposes, you can see where it's coming from. But you need to show where the figures are coming from. If you're doing a CA or you're doing an exam, you can't just throw in a figure. You have to show where you're getting them from to get your marks. All right, so what that means is 39 days last year, 37 days this year. That's a gradual improvement. If you're getting money in two days quicker than you were last year. So that's an improvement. The lower it is, the better. What you'd want to know then, well, what is the industry average? Or what you might want to know is, well, what is the actual credit terms? If the credit terms were, we're selling on credit at 30 days, that's poor because it's taking them 37 days to pay. So clearly you're not following up quick enough. Your customers are not paying you money. So it's all about what did they tell you in the question to get an idea how you're managing your working capital. Some people might say, well, why didn't you use the average trade receivables? Because you have the opening and closing. We don't have 2010. If you were to use the average in 2011 and the average in 2012, you'd need the opening position from 2010 as well. You can't just use the average for one year and not use it for both years. You have to be consistent. So where you don't have the average enough to calculate the average in both years, use the end of year figure in both, which is what we've done there. Inventory days, it's going to be inventory, which in this case is 300 over cost of sales. We come down 1745 times 365. So this is sorry, 300 over 1745 times 365. 62 or 63 days if you're out. 63 days. Just tidy up all of those. Again, the answer is in days. Inventory days. And the formula there is your inventory over your cost of sales times 365. So that's on average, how long does it take you to sell inventory? How long is the inventory on hand before it's sold? So hopefully that makes sense to students. And again, for this one, it is 406, inventory has gone up, divided by 2272 times 365. And that's gone up to 65 days. So that's a gradual disimprovement. It's inventory is on hand two days longer than before. So it's taking you two days longer on average to sell inventory, and that means you're waiting two days longer to get cash in. The lower the inventory days, the lower the trade receivable days, the better. Within reason, you can't have very low inventory days if you're not gonna have stock on hand, because it depends on the type of sector that you have, but you're trying to manage those to reduce them as much as possible. Finally, with trade payable, we take the trade payables, which are 261 over, 1745 times 365. And same here, you're taking the 
trade payables for 2012, 354, divided by 2272 times 365. So 55 days and 57 days. So just so we see where those are coming from. So it's nice and repetitive. And remember, you're going to have the formulas because you're doing the CE. You're going to have all of these. You don't have to learn them off not to, until the exam next time, next year semester. So we're just trying to figure out understanding them for now. So I'm just going to put in there so you'll see exactly where those numbers are coming from. So it took you on average 55 days to pay your, cost, your suppliers last year. It's now taking you 57 days. Now you might say on the face that that's good. What you want to know is, well, what is your relationship with your suppliers? Are you taking longer because you've agreed that? Or are you taking longer because you can't pay them? And an indication there, if you look, we're having a big overdraft now. You've gone from no overdraft up to 76 million of an overdraft, 2011, 2012. There might be an indication there you can't pay. It's not that you've been strategic in managing a relationship with your suppliers. So while on the face of it, that looks good, we need to more need to more know more detail about are the suppliers happy or is this just you not paying because you don't have any cash on hand because you're relying on your overdraft. So it's reading between the lines is vitally important there. So that is looking at some of the key efficiency ratios. Now there are other efficiency ratios that you can calculate. We don't require them in this module. The only efficiency ones, if you're asked for efficiency, would be the working capital. And what you can do if you wanted to. You can calculate the cash conversion cycle, which would be how long it takes you to sell the inventory, plus how long it takes the customers to pay you, minus how much credit you get from your suppliers. So 47 days and 46 days. So the working capital cycle has marginally improved over the last year. There's a 46 day difference from when you pay your suppliers to when you get money in from your customers you have to fund that difference. There's a cost associated with that. And you're going to cover that in much more detail um, in your capital, corporate finance module with Lean in AF2 as well. Right. So that is efficiency ratios, otherwise known as working capital ratios. The next area we're looking at is liquidity. Now, we said liquidity is about the short-term financial position of a business. So it's about short-term cash flow. Are you going to be able to pay the debts as they fall to you? Ideally, you'll compare companies in the same industry, but as a general benchmark, an ideal ratio is two is to one for the current ratio. So twice as much current assets as current liabilities and one is to one for what we call the quick ratio or the asset test ratio. Now, the asset test ratio takes away stock. The basis here is that stock is not easily and quickly converted into cash. It takes a bit of time to sell your stock. So the quick ratio is a more severe test of liquidity. What assets, short-term assets, should you have on hand, ignoring stock, compared to your short-term debts? Now, it is important how you interpret them. A very high liquidity ratio suggests inefficiency, that you're holding too much in inventory, you're holding too much current assets for what you need, because it can be costly to hold current assets. A very low ratio can indicate big liquidity problems because you have little current assets on hand and a lot of current liabilities. So just be careful. You want to be able to interpret what extreme ratios on either side mean as well. And that will come at practice of this, the questions in the question pack, and also the tutorial questions uh, that will happen over the next couple of weeks. So let's take a look at the current ratio and quick ratio for Alexis. So let's start off with the current ratio. It's a nice easy one to remember because it's just current assets, which in this case are 544 divided by current liabilities, which are 291. Be careful, take the right subtotal. Current assets are 544, total assets are 1054. So just make sure you're taking the right one. So current ratio in 2011, we'll put that to one decimal place, usually one decimal place now for this one because it's a smaller number, so 1.9. And we'll just highlight that so people can see it. And then we're going to do here 679 divided by 432. So 1.57. So you're both are below the industry or the ideal of 2 is to 1. So that is 679 divided by 432. 
So if I was commenting on that, you'd say liquidity is below the ideal of two is to one for the current ratio. And I'd say it's deteriorating. Why? It's getting lower. You now have only 1.6, 1 euro 60 cent of current assets for every euro of current liabilities you have. You had 1 euro 90 last year. So liquidity has deteriorated over the period. So see the language you're using there. It's important that you're able to describe what the ratio is, not just calculate it. The other ratio that you can calculate is called the asset test or the quick ratio. That's a more severe test of liquidity. It says just look at current assets less inventory, 244, divided by 291. So you actually hear of less than one. Again, it's below the ideal of one is to one. It's 0.8. Or if you want to be more specific, I think 0.8, uh, 0.84. So you want to have 80 cent in short-term assets, excluding inventory for every short-term liability that you have. So that is 244 divided by 291. And for 2012, it'd be 4273 divided by 432. 273 divided by 432. Again, very poor, 0.63. So liquidity is deteriorating. This suggests this company has liquidity issues, i.e. short-term cash flow. And remember, if you remember back in week five, we already flagged that. We, need, no, we know this company is hemorrhaging cash. It's gone from 4 million positive cash balance to 76 million overdraft in the space of a year. Big liquidity issues. So what's driving the poor performance? is we have a big increase in the overdraft and a big increase in trade payables. The overdraft and trade payables are growing much quicker than inventory and trade receivables, because that's what they're looking at, the relationship between current assets and current liabilities. Your liabilities are growing much quicker than your assets. That's why it's deteriorating over 2011, 2012. So you're tying it into what you've seen at the high level review of the financial statements, and you're looking at the detailed ratios now and you're seeing what they tell you. Generally, they're gonna tell you the same thing. Current ratio is a more basic one. The quick ratio is a more severe test of liquidity. Both of them are below the ideals of two is to one and one is to one, and they're deteriorating. That's the kind of language we want you to explain. And if you can get more information in the question, bring it into your answer. Sometimes the exam question, or for example, the CA, you're gonna have loads of information about the company. Bring that in, knit it into the question to explain why it's deteriorated or improved. Don't just say it's gone from X to Y, explain why. Link it back to what's going on in the business. So the next set of area of performance we're looking at is gearing. So gearing is to look at the longer term debt position of the business or the solvency. How much debt does it have? How is it funded? And is it risky? So one key ratio we look at is the gearing ratio, which is debt over debt plus equity. Now, generally here, we look at the long-term debt in the business over the long-term equity. And this is something you might want to think about for your continuous assessment is you're going to have a book value of equity, which is the, the book value, the assets minus liabilities and statement plan position. There's also a market value because the company you're going to be looking at for your continuous assessment is a listed company. So how does the gearing ratio change if you use the market value or the book value? You need to justify which one is more relevant and figure out what implications that might have for the ratios. You can also look at how much interest you spend, so the interest expense as a portion of sales, or this thing called interest cover. That is, how much cover do you have in your profits to pay the interest? So again, it's looking at how affordable the debt is, as well as your debt position. So this is a focus on something you're also gonna cover in corporate finance, which is called the capital structure. How is the business financed? And what kind of level of financial risk does the business have? The more debt a company has, the higher the gearing ratio, the more risk it has. So it's something very relevant for a lot of stakeholders when they're analyzing a set of financial statements. So let's have a look here at the Alexis company and we calculate some of their gearing ratios or the debt ratios. We already know their debt has gone up year on year. So let's see what impact that has on the overall business. So we're gonna calculate gearing, interest as a percentage of sales, and we're going to look at interest cover. Three different ratios that are focusing on, I suppose, the debt position of the business and what that means, we'll interpret. So gearing, it's debt over debt plus equity. So here, it's 200 debt 
we only look at the long term debt divided by 200 plus 563. So the gearing ratio 26%. 200 over 200 plus 563. So what that means is about one quarter of this business, the answer is in percentages, just over a quarter of this business is financed through debt. Now you'd want to compare that to an industry average because different sectors can take on different levels of debt. They often call that debt capacity, how much debt a company can take on. And that can vary depending on how profitable the company is, the level of assets it has, how old it is, etc. So you want to compare like for like. But general rule is above 50% gearing will be highly geared, below would be lowly geared, as a, a rough rule of thumb. This year now, it's taken on more debt, it's 300, divided by 300 plus 534. So your gearing ratio has gone from 26% up to nearly 36%. Now it's still lowly geared, it's still only 36%, just over a third, but the point is it has gone up. And the reason it's gone up, don't forget to mention that, is because you've taken on new debt. So the company has taken on 100 million debt over the period 2011 to 2012. That's why the gearing ratio has gone up. So saying, explaining the movement, but also clarifying to say it's still not very large. You still more equity than debt in the business. We then look at interest as a percentage of sales. So here, interest in 2011 is 18 over 2240, which was less than 1%. So put a percentage there. So 0.8%. It was 18 over 2240. Just show that formula. And then in here, it was 32 over 2681. So it's just over 1%. So it's gone up, but not usually. 1.2%. The point is here, now some people might ask, well, what's a good benchmark? Very difficult to know. It depends on the organization. What you want to be doing is comparing year on year or comparing to comparable companies. There's no one set benchmark you're saying for these, or oh, if I'm above this, it's bad. It depends on the organization. And you're looking for movements as well year on year. You're looking for a trend analysis. But we know interest has gone up. Interest has nearly doubled. That's why the percentage is going up. The last one gives an indication of how much profits do you have to pay the interest. And you're putting the profit before interest and tax. Now that might have been, let's check the slide here. Profit before interest, which means it's profit before tax as well, because interest comes before tax. That's operating profit. So in our case, it is 243 divided by 18. And the answer there is in times. 243 over 18. So what that means is, the interest covers 13 and a half times. Profit is 13 and a half times your interest. So it's well covered. You have plenty of profits there to be able to afford and pay your interest. Generally, anything above five, six, or seven is good. Anything below that, you'd be a bit worried. Whereas this year now, it's 47 over 32. So that means it's only 1.46. Right? That'd be a big concern. You now only have just over one and a half times interest as profits. So it's very tight. Any fall at all in profitability could leave you not being able to afford your interest. So it's a measure of affordability. Now, as we discussed uh, in week five in class, we're hoping and we're giving indication this may be a temporary fall in profitability because you're bringing in a new warehouse, you're hiring a lot of new staff. It might take time to bed in. But if this is the continued performance next year or the year after in terms of profitability, you'd be very concerned to say with the higher rising level of debt, increased interest associated with that debt, we may not be able to afford this in the future. And that gives you an indication how deteriorated the interest cover ratio has. You're still lowly geared overall, but the affordability of interest is a concern, particularly if this profitability level continues that low into the future. So that's looking at the gearing ratios, focusing on your debt position and how affordable that debt is in the business. The last key focus we're looking at is investment ratios. So this is from an investor's perspective. Well, is this an attractive company to invest in? What are the key things we're looking for, either as a current investor or as a potential investor? 
And remember, the investors are interested in two things. Either getting dividends out, so getting money out on a regular basis from the company that's profitable, or increasing the share price. And so that's what they're focused on in terms of some key metrics. And if I show you, for example, when we go through, there's four different metrics here. Earning per share, so the profit after tax, the total earnings divided by the number of shares. The price earnings ratio, that gives you an indication of how dear or cheap a share is. It looks at the, the multiple of the share price divided by the earnings per share. So how many times earnings is the share price currently trading at? So the higher it is, either that you can see it as the dearer it is, or that people want it, it's in demand. So there's different ways to interpret a price earnings ratio. And we look at some companies now in a second in the real world to see what that means for them. You can then look at dividend per share. How much dividends do you get per share every year, depending how profitable the company is. But you can also look at dividend cover, which is similar enough in concept to interest rate cover. How much profits are there to cover the dividends? The higher that is, the safer you'd expect your dividend payment uh, each year. So let's calculate these for Lexus first, and then we're going to look at some real world companies to say, well, are these actually used in the real world? And the short answer is they are. People are very interested in these key metrics and investors look at them regularly when they're pricing and buying and selling shares on the stock exchange. So let's look at Lexus. We're going to use some information down the bottom as well. They're telling us around dividends. They're telling us around the share price. So we need a lot of that. We're starting off initially is we're going to calculate EPS. This is a hugely important metric in the financial markets. So much so it has its own international accounting standard. So you won't cover till next year on AF3, but IAS 33, it actually has its own international accounting standard, how to calculate EPS. Because it's so important, there's a clear set of rules. We're only looking at a basic calculation here. There's a much clearer set of rules how to calculate earnings per share. And the formula is just is the profits, which is 165 million. I'm just going to do it out fully because you're doing euros over the number of shares. 165 million over the number of shares. Be careful. This is where students go wrong. There are 600. Just get my zeros right. 600 million shares. So that's 0.275 per share. 27 and a half cent per share is the earnings per share. Now, where does that come from? This says there's 300 million share capital, but each share is worth 50 cent. So there's 600 million shares to get you 300 million euro of share capital. Be very careful in that. Always figure out what the nominal value of shares are. We're not worried about the market value yet. We're just worried about the total profits, which is 165 divided by 600. 165 million profits or 600 million shares. In this one, it's 11 over 600. The number of shares hasn't changed, but what has changed is the profitability. Profitability has fallen dramatically. That means earnings per share has fallen dramatically as well. So it's just earnings divided by the shares. So it kind of gives you a bit of a proxy when you're buying a share, how much earnings are they earning per share? So you can kind of benchmark that when you're deciding a, re a relative, a relevant price to, to buy the share at or to sell the share. And that brings us on to our next key metric. It looks at the relationship between the share price and the earnings per share. So you're saying what multiple is the share price trading at? We're given the share price at the end of 11. You're told in note one it was 250 and now it's 150. So straight away we can see the share price has fallen. People are not happy with how the company's performing and they've, they've essentially sold a lower price. The share price has deteriorated. We want to see, has it deteriorated in line with profitability? What multiple of profits are people paying for a share? So here, it is the price, 250, over 0.275. So 9.09 .09 times, that's the answer. So in 2011, people were paying nine times earnings for a share in the business. In 2012, people were paying one euro 50 divided by 0 0.018333. They were paying 81.8 times here. So this is 250 divided by 0.275 and this is 150 divided by 0 0.018333. 
So how do we interpret that? Is it that this company is so much more attractive now that people are willing to pay 81 times earnings now instead of nine times last year? It's not. You need to read between the lines here. What's happened is profitability has fallen off a cliff, but it looks like people think that's temporary. Yes, they're not happy because the share price has gone from 250 to 150, but they don't think that's a fair reflection of what the true profitability is because you're comparing a static figure, the profit figure, which is historic, and a future oriented figure, which is the share price. So this suggests that people don't think the next year's earnings per share is going to be that low. That's why the share price hasn't fallen to the same extent as earnings per share. All right, so watch for that. You can get unusual earnings per share figures, or price earnings ratio figures, should I say, because the top figure is a future one. That share price is looking towards the future. The bottom figure is what's happened in the past. If shareholders don't believe that is a true reflection on earnings, they may pay more than it looks as viable in the current share price. So it's not that they're paying 81 times earnings, it's that they expect earnings to be a lot bigger next year. So it might only be paying nine or 10 times like it was last year. So reading between the lines is important. Uh, and look at the real world, we look at those in a second to figure what are the PE ratios and how did they change over time? Right. What we're left with then is the dividend per share, some kind called DPS. Dividend was 40 million both years. We're told that in the question. Note five divided by 600. 40 divided by 600, and it didn't change. It was the same both years. So about 6.7 cent per share. And you can round if you want, but that's per share. And that's in euros, so 0 0.06666 is 6.6 .6 cent per share. Now, we already questioned that and we said, this company is paying dividends even though it's losing cash. So you'd question why are they continuing to pay 40 million dividends when they're expanding, when they're running up big overdraft? Because essentially, that 40 million in dividends, this one here, is coming out of the overdraft because the overdraft has gone up by 76 million. So from a financial management perspective, which you'll deal with in corporate finance, you'd question that. Could you postpone the dividend for a year or would the shareholders be happy with that? Sometimes you have a family business. They want to get regular dividends each year. Other times shareholders would understand and say, we're happy for you to delay that dividend if it means we are expanding. So they are the kind of comments you want to make. Dividend cover looks at profit after tax. There's no preference shares here. If there was preference shares and preference dividend, you would take those off because they get paid, as the name suggests, in preference or before ordinary shareholders. Whereas dividend cover, it's just going to be profit after tax, 165 over dividends, 11 over 40. So what we can see here is you have four times dividends in profits in 2011. You don't even have the same for 11 over 40 in 2012. So what's happening is you're actually paying out historic profits in 2012. You don't even have the 40 million in profits to pay out. You're relying on previous years. So it really suggests in 2012, you should be holding back that dividend. Although the company is profitable, it's marginally so. And it's in a state of flux. It's not a good idea to pay out 40 million. You're putting yourself under financial issues, financial distress, because we know liquidity is already a problem with the big overhead or the big overdraft that's run up over the last year. So that's the kind of stuff we're looking for students to bring out is you're telling a story. Big liquidity problems here. Debt doesn't look too bad from a financial position perspective, but affordability in terms of profitability is a big concern. So a lot of this analysis is fig riding on the fact that we hope this is a temporary blip in profitability decline, which is based on the fact we've taken on a lot of new headcount, we've taken on a new you're told to your warehouse and distribution center, which mean need time to bet in. You're never going to have all the answers in a ratios question. What the ratios are there to do is to highlight problems. And what you're trying to figure out then is, what are the things I need to raise to show that I understand what the key issues are and what might need to be investigated further? That's the kind of stuff you're going to be doing with your CA as well. But you're going to have a lot more information then to dig through to figure out what is the story? Why did these ratios move? And what does it mean for the business? 
taking a couple of companies, then well, let's look at some of these key ratios. So for example here, let's look at Ryanair Financial Times summary. That's what I often put in. And you'll get a nice summary, you click the first link, of the financial or the Ryanair's key metrics. So if you come down here, the story is all about Ryanair, its share price history. But if you come down here, there's nice metrics. Current earnings per share for Ryanair is actually a loss, minus 58 cent. So their share price is trading at about 17 euros, but there's a minus, they're making a loss. That means you can't have a price earnings ratio. It's not feasible because it's a positive figure divided by a negative figure. So that really is why you have to be careful when you're interpreting P ratio. If you interpret that very strictly, you'd say the price should be nil. Why would you pay any multiple of loss? Remember, the share price is looking towards the future. They're not paying 17 euro for a loss making company. They know that loss is temporary because it was COVID. They expect the profits to come back and they're buying based on those expected future profits. So how you interpret the PE ratio is important. Unless it's a very steady state business, a very steady state economy, the PE ratio has to be very much interpreted with care. So let's go back and let's have a look at another one then in terms of, for example, uh, another business we might be used to. So let's look, for example, here at Glombia or Kerry Group. So instead of Ryanair, let's look at Kerry. Kerry Group Financial Times summary. And it gives us the same information. So we can see the share price, but you come down here. Oh, I clicked on the wrong one there. Give a summary. Tab. And you come down along. So we can see here. Current trading price about 116 euro. Current earnings per share 320. So roughly when you divide 116, now it depends which one, there's various formulas, say 116 on average, divided by 320, you get about 36 times the PE ratio. TTM there says trailing 12 months. So it says the last 12 months. So depending on what recent quarterly results are coming out, they take the last four quarters. They don't just wait once a year they take a trailing 12 month period, whatever the last recent 12 months were. So you can see here, the PE ratio is 36 times. That's what people, people are willing to pay 36 times earnings for uh, a share in this business. The company is paying a dividend of 89 um, pence per euro. And that means a dividend yield, which is just the dividend divided by the share price of 77% or 0.77%. So it's kind of like the return you're getting each year. You can compare that, for example, to a deposit income. Let's take one other one as an example. So carrier trading at 36 times. What are, for example, Glombia trading at? Similar company. For Glombia Financial Times Summary. I would bring up this just as an example. So Glombia, they're currently trading at 24 times. So their profits are about 57 cents per share. And they're, tra they're currently trading about 13, 14 euro, 13.8, 14 euro. So they're less attractive in the market or less expensive, depending on how you interpret it, compared to Kerry Group. A lot of the PE ratio can be indicative of the growth potential of the business, but it also may, may be indicative that the company is overpriced. But these are key statistics, as the Financial Times says, that are used when you're investing in a business. What is the earnings per share? What is the PE multiple? What is the dividend per share? Investors use these to figure out, is this a worthwhile company to invest in? Is it overpriced? Is it underpriced? And now they don't give it here, but you can calculate what is the dividend cover as well? Because if you have the dividend figure, how much they're paying, and you know the summary financials, which you can get easily because this is a listed company, it'll be relatively easy to figure out what the dividend cover is. So that's looking at some of the key investor ratios and why they might be important as well. And we're going to put that into practice in terms of some tutorials and um, some questions in the question pack over the next couple of weeks. All right. So make sure you go back over that Alexis question. Just have a look at the financial statements in general, taking note of the points that we made in week five when we looked at it before we calculate the ratios. And just practice interpreting the ratios. There's a couple of nice textbooks. I'll reference them now briefly at the end. Have a read of at least one or two of those chapters because you need to read around the ratios to understand what they mean. It's not just sufficient now for any CA for exam 
just to give me calculation ratios. You need to go on and interpret why did that happen? What does it mean for the business? Can you tell the story? All right. One other small thing you might come across, more so in the real world than in, uh, in this module here, is a thing called the enterprise value. When we talk about the market value of equity, we're actually talking about this thing called the market cap. So that's the market value of equity, 4 billion. So Glom B is market value today is about 4 billion, market cap, which is the number of shares times the share price. Now that's different than the book value of equity, which you will see in the statement of financial position. The market value is often a lot bigger because again, we talked about this in terms of what financial statements include and what they exclude. But if we want to know what's the total value of the enterprise, it's the market value of equity, the shares, plus the market value of debt, less any cash that's in the business. Now, theoretically, that could be seen as the takeover price. If you wanted to buy out the whole business, you have to pay off all the debt, say at the market value, you have to buy out all the shares at their market value, but you also then you buy whatever cash is on the balance sheet. So that can be taken off the net cost. So it's often a, a very useful one in corporate finance where you don't want to get mixed up in terms of capital structures. You just want to know what's the value of the business if it was bought outright. If I pay off all the debt holders, pay off all the equity holders and take any cash that's sitting on the balance sheet. So that's often called that in here in this red, it's often called the net debt. What's the debt in the business? Net of any cash. And that's a very important metric that is used in corporate finance, for example, to value businesses. You can use an enterprise value over EBITDA um, multiple. So instead of using the price over earnings ratio, the price of equity over the earnings per share, you can use the enterprise value over EBITDA. And remember we came across EBITDA before, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. So just when you're reading articles in the Financial Times, you might be doing stuff in corporate finance, enterprise value and EBITDA are often used a lot more than the, the market value, the price uh, and the uh, earnings per share. But they're just in case you know what they are, it's theoretically if you wanted to buy the whole business today, pay everyone off, that would be the enterprise value. Market value of equity plus the market value of debt, less any cash on the balance sheet. All right, so hopefully you've got a good idea so far between week five and this week, week seven, of what ratio analysis or financial statement or analysis is about. Right? It's one thing being an accountant, being able to prepare a set of financial statements, knowing your debits and credits, posting a journal, balancing T accounts, doing a trial balance and all that. That's part of it. But you have to be able to take a set of financial statements and tell a story. It's a very efficient way of understanding a business. It's not going to solve all the items but it's really going to reduce that detailed information. It gives you concise information, right? And it helps you, I suppose, ask questions. It allows you to give insight of what, what line items are growing, what line items are moving. So it's a very efficient way of giving meaning to figures. You can put profit relative to sales. You can look at, for example, debt relative to equity. You can allow compare business and benchmark that business then to industry ratios to peer companies. So it's a very effective way and it's used right throughout business. Banks use it to figure out should they give you a loan, right? Corporate finance people use it to value a business. They're looking at your margins, how profitable you are. They're looking at your debt position. They're looking at that to value the business, to buy or sell it. So a lot of stakeholders will use this um, for various reasons. That being said, ratios itself is not perfect. Right. As we looked at in week five, a ratio in isolation is pointless. If I told you the gearing ratio is 20%, it's very hard to know what that means until you look at industry companies. What was the budget of gearing ratio? So they are useful analysis, but you need context. Context is hugely important here. That'll be the annual report and the website for your continuous assessment. And any exam question, I'll give you a narrative about the business. I'll tell you how they're getting on. I'll tell you what industry they're in. And I might even give you industry averages. Right? Likewise, you have to be careful when you're comparing companies because some companies can have different accounting policies. Some companies might revalue property, plant and equipment. Other companies may not. And that can throw out uh, distortions in terms of interpreting ratios. So it's just important to realize that calculating ratio can seem straightforward, but interpreting it and comparing it to other companies 
uh, can be a minefield for errors and misinterpretation. And that, that phrase is very important there, garbage in, garbage out. If you put bad assumptions in, if you put misleading figures in, you're going to get a misleading ratios. So it's about that attention to detail of to, if I'm comparing ratios in one business to another, I better make sure they're calculated similarly and likewise that they have similar accounting policies. Otherwise, any interpretation is going to be meaningless. All right? So they are useful, but they have limits. So that's what we're kind of saying here. Powerful tool, but it has limitations. All right? Context is important. Either do cross-sectional, compare to budgets, compare to trend analysis, what happened last year, compared to the competitors, but you need to get that context. You have to say, and that's what you're going to be doing in your assignment. You're going to be looking for other companies. I'm not getting you to do the analysis, but I want you to pick relevant companies. Who would you compare to and why? What are the companies that are similar to the company you have in your assignment? Uh, but also I might give you, for example, in exam questions, I give you industry averages and you'll be comparing to say, is the company's performance good or not now when you compare it to their peers? but you must compare like for like. It doesn't make sense to compare profitability or liquidity in a supermarket to a construction company and then to compare it to uh, a fast-moving consumer goods like Unilever or Procter Gamble. They're different businesses. You have to compare like for like. Same companies in same sectors doing the same businesses, same business models. All right. So hopefully you've got a good idea of the approach from the in-class example Alexis. What we did in week five was very important. That high level, figure out who you are. So are you a shareholder? Are you a bank? Are you an employee? Because that'll kind of influence what your commentary is going to be in your conclusion. Once you've got an idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it, then you're going to quick look at the information. You're doing the eyeball test. Look at the movements. What are the key movements in the statement flange position? What are the key movements in the other statements that you're given? And any notes or sometimes you'll be given extra narrative. That can inform you and kind of start to build a story. We knew profitability was declining. We knew costs were growing very quickly. We knew there was a cash flow issue before we calculated any ratio. And then it's the ratios, which you'll usually be guided to in the question that you're going to calculate. That'll give you more detail about where the problems are and start raising more specific issues. So high level first, look at the financial statements, Look at the broad story and the detail then is in the ratios. All right. And this is a very practical thing. You're going to come across this if you go into the working world. Valuing businesses, they use that in terms of profitability margins. They look at for forecasts. Banks use it. They want to see your current gearing ratio. They want to see, can you, for example, take on this debt and be able to afford it? Managers will use this to benchmark profitability across stores. They'll use it to benchmark financial position of businesses. So your key takeaway here is it's a very important skill uh, as an accounting graduate to be able to read and analyze the financial performance of a business. Not just prepare financial statements, but read them. What does it tell you? And it does allow you to dig deeper. It doesn't give you all the answers because you're going to need to tell that story, but it helps you ask the right questions. So we know questions are now, is this profitability a permanent decline? Or was it temporary because of the new warehouse and taking on the new staff? So we know the questions to focus on. We need to focus on why the dividend was paid. Is it going to be paid in the future? We don't have the answers, but that's the way the question is set up, that the good student can identify the problems and say what needs to be done. That's the way the requirements will be set up as well. Okay, so hopefully you have a good grasp now between the last two weeks, week five and week seven, of what financial statement analysis is all about. My first recommendation is read a chapter in a textbook. Just doing the lectures is only going to give you a smaller picture about what financial statement analysis is about. It's useful to read around it. Now, you will come across maybe other ratios. Um, they're not required. The only ratios that are required um, are the ones in the deck. If you want to add extra ones, that's fine. But the core requirement are the ones that are in the deck. Uh, have a read of either or both of L8 and L8 and the Connolly chapters. Just it'll help you for the continuous assessment and it'll help further your understanding of what each of the ratios are. There's a question pack open loop. I'll put up the solutions as well. Practice those. And there's going to be two tutorials then on financial statement analysis over the next couple of weeks. It is a key topic, so make sure you know it well. And of course, it forms the foundation of your continuous assessment, which you'll be doing over the next uh, two months as well.
right? So hopefully you found that useful. See all the material that is available on Loop. And we will talk to you again then in week eight. We're going to have face-to-face -face session back in the normal slot. We're going to talk about the CA, which has been released on Loop. Take a look at it. Have a chat at it amongst your group. And we'll talk that first. And then we'll move on to the next topic, which will be available on Loop at the start of week eight. See you all then.